Okay, I'm going live now because the sun is setting and we may not have enough light, you know, to uh, show you what's going on. Just an important political event happening now because uh, Gadir, the eighth prisoner who was taken with us, uh, with myself, uh, is being released now from the uh, prison just up the hill there. There's the watchtower, there's the prison entrance over there with the tent over the entranceway. Now all of the people here are waiting for Gadir to be released. The man over there with the gray hair, he is uh, Gadir's um, husband. Uh, he was in prison with us as well. So uh, everybody is, you know, uh, getting well organized here. And we're waiting for Gadir to be released. <coughs> She's been released uh, after, uh, since we were in uh, custody detention from Tuesday, 12.30 until Wednesday at about three o'clock, and uh, now uh, Kadir has been uh, detained. Here's this is her first arrest, and she's been under detention now since Tuesday, which makes it uh, six days. A very petite woman who was enraged that her husband was being uh, beaten by a soldier, and so now he's, she's being charged with uh, some sort of offense, supposedly because she bit a soldier. Whereas the soldiers, of course, they don't get charged with anything unless we proceed, as I intend to do, with a civil suit against the military in the Israel court. And in addition, I intend to proceed with a legal action against the state of Israel in a Jewish court, Sahad, Sahandrin uh, court in Canada, to denounce the state of Israel in the name of the Jewish people. Here we go, yes. Uh, well, Bina Mandel, hi. Abdul Karim, hi. Please share the video. We're going to show the liberation of Gadir right now. She's going to be coming out of the prison soon. We're a bit early. Everybody's coming here. This is, you know, there's no sort of, you know, like, place to receive prisoners who are being liberated. You know, there's the highway here, right next to the prison, you know, and everybody's supposed to just park on the side of the highway, climb up a hill here, out of the ravine from the other highway over there where the other cars are parked. And this is where we're supposed to wait. Oh, here's some barbed wire just to add to the scene. Okay. Pour les Québécois, écoute. Ce qui est arrivé ici, c'est qu'il y a une autre Palestinienne qui euh, sera libérée maintenant ici. Nous en attendons pour notre camarade avec qui on était euh, détenu euh, le mardi passé. Avec moi aussi. Moi, j'étais détenu pendant le jour et la nuit. Mais Gadir, une petite femme, était détenue plus longtemps parce qu'elle était fâchée avec un soldat euh, depuis que des autres soldats avaient fait battre sa, son mari. Alors, euh, il prend des revanges sur elle. Et euh, son mari, ici, il a été libéré avec nous autres, le 7. Mais, euh, et moi et euh, des autres prisonniers, ex-prisonniers là-bas. Et on a été libérés si vite parce qu'il y a un avocat privé qui est venu. Malheureusement, parce qu'il prend des. Il prend des, des des milliers de shakels pour avoir nous fait un peu de travail. Alors, on attend ici encore. Oui, c'est ça. On a été libérés sans accusation par la police. On a été détenus en première instance par le militaire, qui était légal, mais quand même, il fait n'importe quoi, sur un terrain qui était secteur C après l'Oslo. Euh, et c'est ça le, le secteur euh, proche de la la colonie de Maal Ephraim, qui est proposée être annexée par le candidat euh, dans l'élection euh, euh, d'Israël euh, qui sera tenue demain, Netanyahu, qui propose faire l'annexation de toutes les, les colonies euh, avec leur euh, prolongation aussi, les prolongations illégales. Illégales, illégales. Alors, nous, on a été arrêtés sur un terrain qui n'était pas annexé encore mais qui est considéré comme Israël quand même. 
Alors, c'est tout euh, arbitraire ici. C'est le militaire qui gouverne et il n'y a pas de loi euh, d'Israël qui s'applique. Il n'y a pas de loi de Palestine qui s'applique, même à les Palestiniens, après le militaire. Et certainement, il n'y a pas de loi internationale qui s'applique. Alors, on a été kidnappés, pas arrêtés, mais détenus, pris en otage. Et le frais de libération, c'était soi-disant 5 000 shekels. OK, en anglais. So, uh, we were taken by the military on Sector C, which is supposedly governed by Israel, the sovereignty of Israel, with their sovereign military force at Shahal. Except that, consider this, you know, the uh, candidate, you know, to be the prime minister again, Netanyahu, the other day, you know, proposed that the uh, settlements and the outposts, uh, which are doubly illegal, um, would be annexed as a camping promise as the Golan Heights, you know, was recently annexed by Israel and confirmed by the United States of America, but not by anybody else. Ooh, perhaps uh, a couple of uh, semi-fascist European countries. So, the land on which we were arrested, next to the settlement of Mael uh, Ephraim, has not been annexed because it is being proposed for annexation. Okay, so get the logic here. So, how could we have been detained for having infringed upon this private property when, in fact, it is not private property, it's just, you know, squatted? Okay, so that's what the military will have to answer to, because uh, I intend to take the military to Israel court and sue them for damages, for a criminal abduction, in effect. Now. In addition, being a Jewish Canadian, I am intending to charge the State of Israel with uh, a violation of um, my rights as a Jewish uh, person in a Jewish court in Canada, in a Jewish court which is called Sahadrin, Internal Jewish Community Court, governed by rabbis most likely. And uh, we'll see what's going to happen there. You know, I'm not going to let this be ignored because Israel cannot get away with this and will not get away with all of this. Okay, who else is here? Fella. Hi, Fella. Ah. Mahmoud Ali. Hi. Welcome. Walen al Salam. Teresa Lynn, grazie. Welcome. We're waiting for uh, Gabir to be released now from prison after six days in detention for nothing, as we were kept in a detention military base for a day and a night, you know, without. Without sight, without food, without hands even tied together, without a blanket until very late, without sleep, and for food, okay, the story of the food that day, okay. At about um, four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, um, I ask for uh, some food, okay. Some soldier brings me over, you know, like, like a portion of a slice of American bread and a, a and that was it, you know, to which I made the comment, ah, oh, American bread, that must be the problem. And then uh, later on, asking for some food again, got a slice of rye bread, yes, Jewish rye bread, just a slice, and even got a cold glass of water, even though we were starting to get uh, really chilled, you know, because it was nighttime. Nighttime it gets cold here, even though daytime is starting to warm up in the spring here. Much later on, like around 11 o'clock, I finally got a soldier who agreed to provide me with a chocolate sandwich, a Nutella sandwich, with two slices of rye bread. <laughs> to which 
I actually said the uh, the Jewish prayer to you know, which is. Uh, uh, and after that, all the soldiers say Amen. <laughs> you know, like because like they were obligated, and because uh, they started to uh, realize that they were caught in a little sort of you know mental trap there because they had arrested a Jewish guy for being in what they call the land of Israel. You know, so where's the contradiction in their heads? And good for that. Unfortunately, I was released too soon. I would have preferred to stay and fight. But a private lawyer came along and actually got us out the next day. To which he now wants to charge us some thousands of shekels, which is the penalty for having a, a little bit of freedom here. Anyways, the military will not uh, be able to get away with this and they have not gotten away with this you know already we have had a victory you know seven of us have been released and today Gadir is going to be released as well so we're doing well that makes uh, seven victories and an eighth victory about to come down the familiarity the camaraderie the solidarity here is so evident and so strong. Some didn't. These are Palestinian workers coming back from a day of work, probably inside 48 Palestine, what's called Israel. There's 110,000 uh, Palestinian uh, workers with a permit who go to work in inside Israel for lesser wages, of course. 110,000 with a permit, and another 60,000 cross over without a permit. And yet, you know, they claim they have to build, you know, a security wall, it's called, the wall of apartheid. Israel's apartheid. Not Israeli apartheid, because the Israelis are not in agreement with all this. Maybe uh, Netanyahu and his party, Likud, are going to get, um, you know, 26% of the vote, and a few other, you know, small. Uh, far-right parties will get uh, a few percentages of the vote, you know, probably 6% or 7% for a couple of others to make a coalition government. But the rest of the Israeli public, you know, uh, can't take this anymore, you know, because all this, you know, uh, the settlements, you know, are eating up all the money and the military is eating up all the money and their children are being eaten up by the military for three years and two years for the women at a time when they should be in university. So, uh, you know, it's destroying the Israelis' lives as well, you know, this whole occupation trip and the Zionist, you know, nation state thing, which is a throwback to 1648 and, and the German the Treaty of Westphalia an obsolete option which Europe has abandoned because uh, they just ended up slaughtering its, each other for for a couple of centuries and yet Israel wants to replicate that whole constitutional format and paradigm okay it'll fall but not before we resist here we continue now it's the sun is set, night is falling, but we will continue to broadcast this liberation of Gadir. She's coming out of the prison soon. The eighth prisoner who was detained last Tuesday. Voila, voila, yes. This is the husband of Gadir. Uh, okay. Now. Okay. You want some more barbed wire? Here's some more barbed wire. Albina Mendel Yizrari, welcome. Abdul Karim Dalbab, welcome. Wahalam. 
Mariel, welcome. Mahmoud Ali. Raja. Okay, we are the welcoming party for Gadir, who's coming out of the prison there soon. Okay, so here you have a view of Palestine. We're in the um, Sector C, Jordan Valley. Hills all around, of course. There's uh, some more hills. And uh, way back there is probably Jordan. We're so close. Uh, inside the road there is Tulkaram, the village, to which we had to pass a checkpoint with uh, three nasty-looking soldiers with their um, M16 uh, automatic rifles uh, pointed at us as we pass by, being stared at. And now we are here at the side of the prison where Gadir is still being uh, detained and from which he will be liberated soon. More Palestinian workers descending here, going back home. So they have to uh, get up like uh, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning in order to make it, you know, to work on the other side of the apartheid wall. It takes them about two hours to get to work, about two hours to get back. Unpaid travel time, of course. <laughs> at their own cost and then they have a few hours with their family and then they have to go back in order to sustain their family because there's very little work in Palestine off in the distance there you can see the watchtower in the front there the tent is the entrance way to the prison where the soldiers you know keep guard and then there's some sort of, you know, uh, structure there. Which I can't make out what it is, but it goes right across the highway. Gadir, Gadir, we are waiting for you. Okay. Here's some uh, ravine, you know, with the olive trees. Olive trees everywhere. And the settlers, they try to uh, cut down or burn, you know, as many olive, olive trees as they can. They're into uh, a military strategy, I would say. You know, the settlements are a military outpost. They're not really uh, uh, civilian settlers. They are a military outpost on the private lands of the Palestinian villages in which they are encroaching upon in order to acquire more and more Palestinian land. Oh, here comes a military jeep. Oh, no, it's some sort of, you know, military transport. And then the uh, most fascistic elements in each settlement, you know, they uh, organize themselves into uh, clubs. They go into, you know, um, uh, training. I've seen them and I've recorded them on uh, my uh, the videos that I've taken, which are on my video channel on YouTube. They do training in, in which they practice going into uh, a building and shooting it up and uh, practicing, practicing as if they were going to do another Nakba from 1948 to chase out the Palestinians once more. But what's ironic is that um, there's already two million uh, Palestinian refugees in Jordan. So they cannot be pushed out into Jordan. Jordan would not allow them to be pushed out into Jordan. They have sort of, you know, like a peace treaty with Israel in which 
uh, they, uh, Israel will not allow those uh, two million refugees uh, to return, you know, to their lands in uh, Palestine, of course. And uh, Jordan doesn't want to have any more Palestinian refugees because the Jordanian population is only, uh, previously was only about two million, including the Bedouins from ancient uh, uh, Nabatia, the Bedouins. Uh, and so uh, there's two million Palestinian refugees, two million Jordanians. The two million Palestinian refugees have now been granted pretty well citizenship. And the queen even herself is Palestinian. So uh, Jordan, you know, agrees not to send back those two million, you know, Palestinian refugees. And uh, there are many Palestinians here in the West Bank even who still retain their Jordanian um, um, identities. Uh, I don't know about passports, but they have uh, papers from Jordan. And uh, even the Samaritans, the Jewish Palestinians who are here since forever, um, have uh, Jordanian uh, identity papers together with Palestinian identity papers and Israel citizenship. So the settlements, they come there, you know, to um, steal as much land as they can from the villages. And there's not that many s settlers, you know, like it's increased tremendously, okay, but in the whole of the West Bank, there's like 400,000 settlers, 200,000 in East Jerusalem, uh, 400,000 here. But the number of Palestinians is two and a half million. Okay, so their strategy is to take up as much land as possible, you know, like each settler gets, you know, like a, a private house, you know, with surrounding garden and lands, you know, to spread out as much as possible. And then they set up, you know, like greenhouses all around and, and um, you know, set up a perimeter, a safety perimeter, you know, like with uh, motion detectors and lights, you know, even further away from this actual settlement itself. Oh, visitor. Okay. Yes, they're stopping. Yes, they're coming out. <laughs> Uh, but not to bringing their guns out with them. So, uh, they're finding out what's going on. So the soldier's um, motioning with his hand as if he was directing people to stand somewhere or other. Hello there. Yes, you're being recorded. You're on live Canada feed okay close the door get lost okay bye oh sorry you can't say get lost that's considered to be uh, an offense especially when you're under detention and if a soldier is saying to you you know like shake it you know like which means quiet but the way they say it, it means like shut up if you say that back to them like I did one time the soldier turned to me and said what you said shake it to me you told me to shut up I said, oh, no, I just said check it, it means quiet, doesn't it? And it does, that's what it means in Hebrew. So he backed off. But, uh, oh yeah, another favorite expression of the soldiers during our detention was, lo deberit, which means don't talk, especially if you're talking in Arabic. Not permitted. And then the soldiers which shout at um, all the, everybody, including Palestinian prisoners, in uh, Hebrew only, even if they might know some Arabic. More Palestinian workers coming back. Pass the whole day at work and only the night in the dark with her families. Here's the moon up there as well, the moon crescent. New moon, new moon. Okay, Gadir, where are you? We're waiting for you to be liberated from the prison. Uh huh. Yeah, so uh, Lo de Barrett means, you know, like, uh, don't talk. And uh, pronounced in a way that if you don't obey, then you may be subject to violence. Okay. And uh, actually, Abdel Nassar, uh, an older man, you know, in traditional garb, who knows a lot of, you know, Arabic chants and, and songs and stuff, when he was told, you know, to shut up once, you know, when he was explaining that he was in Palestine and not in Israel, he got pissed off and he started to chant. And so they took him to another room 
and then he started to sing and so they slapped him around on the head until he lost consciousness so he was um, beaten up and then uh, when he regained consciousness about an hour later he was brought back to our cell and uh, he was not in a very healthy state Okay, still waiting for Kadir. More workers coming back. Okay, we're still live. We'll continue to be live for the release of Gadir from the prison, the eighth prisoner taken last Tuesday. A number of us who were taken last Tuesday as prisoner are present here. Uh, her husband here, one, myself, two, Nasser, three, Ghassan, four, well, five, five of us are here. Okay. More Palestinians coming back from work. Coming back by uh, minibus, probably. So that means uh, they're carrying all their daily possessions with them. So that means that they've been working in side 48. Yeah, here's another minibus transporting the workers back. Okay. This is Palestine. And that is a Zionist prison over there, planted on Palestine. Now, the host settlement project and the proposed annexation that Netanyahu has, uh, has announced uh, in this election campaign just the other day is part of a host strategy. Okay, now the Zionists don't do anything without strategy. The Zionist movement has been planning this whole uh, project since 1897. Now, the way in which they've been able to be successful is this. I'll explain it to you. The first wave of uh, settlers came as a result of the uh, Holocaust, but not voluntarily. My parents were refugees in the refugee camp of Breslau in the American sector of Germany when the Zionists came into the refugee camp and uh, tried to recruit people to go to Palestine. My father told me that he refused because um, he didn't want to go to another war him being, you know, a religious uh, orthodox uh, pacifist. And uh, he uh, was never, you know, a Zionist because uh, before the Holocaust, before the war, the uh, vast majority of the Jewish people in Eastern Europe were not Zionists. They were socialists and uh, they supported uh, to a greater extent than any other political party in the municipal elections, the Jewish Bund, which was a Jewish socialist civil rights movement that uh, was very strong at that time. It had a trade union movement as well. Okay, most of our members, I, my mother was a Jewish Bundist from Warsaw, so uh, I'm a Jewish Bundist. But most of the Jewish Bundes members were killed, you know, in the Holocaust by the Nazis and burned, of course, including my family, most of my family. Out of about 400 members in both of my father's and mother's families, uh, four survived, four out of 400. You get that? Four out of 400. Okay. So the refugees there in the refugee camp, they could go to uh, another country if they had, you know, a member of their family in another country that would sponsor them for a visa. If they didn't have a member of their family in another country that would sponsor them for a visa, they couldn't go to that country because that country wouldn't accept them. They didn't want to have Jewish refugees. I'm talking about Canada, United States, South America. Europe was not hospitable 
to the Jewish population. Those Jewish people who went back to Poland, for instance, were very mistreated. And there was even uh, a massacre that took place of Jewish people, about 75 Jewish people, after the Holocaust, after the war was over, in a village called Kielce, which was uh, promoted by the uh, Catholic Church and even by the Communist Party, and uh, whose members were also in the Catholic Church. And the uh, Communist Party made excuses uh, thereafter, but uh, they didn't stop the massacre from taking place. In fact, some of their members actually uh, promoted it. So they didn't want to go back to Poland. And uh, Russia was not hospitable to the Jewish people either, you know, because the Jewish Bundes uh, leadership were imprisoned and, and died in prison under uh, the Communist Party rule. And the Jewish Bundes who, uh, who were invited to join the Communist Party and form a Jewish section were later, you know, purged and uh, put into prison and killed as well. So there was not an option. So there they are in the refugee camp. 52% got visas to go to other countries, including my parents. And 48% did not. So they were sent to Palestine. Now, of course, the, uh, the other option would have been, you know, to set up a Jewish autonomous territory in the area of Breslau in Germany, so that Jewish people would finally have, you know, like land to live on, you know, that was uh, controlled by themselves. But no, 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 nobody, you know, like uh, proposed that, nobody thought of that, nobody asked for that because nobody expected that it could be granted. Okay, so that's how the first wave of uh, 500,000 or, or maybe 300,000 or so came to Palestine to settle. Settle in where? Settle in the Palestinian houses, of course, that were evacuated, you know, under the uh, uh, Zionist militias. Um, a military offensive against the Palestinian residents there who went from village to village you know massacring a certain number to induce the uh, the rest of the residents of the villages you know two to three thousand people to leave to go to the next village then the Zionist militia would move on to the next village do the same thing again massacre a bunch of Palestinians so that the others you know would flee away and this you know wave of refugees you know went so far as into uh, the West Bank. And why did the Zionist militia stop at the West Bank, at what's called the Green Line, where some of the uh, apartheid wall is constructed now? Well, because the Jordanian, Jordanian army finally sent some military forces to stop the advance of the Zionist militias. Now, the Jordanian military was uh, much larger than the Zionist militias, and they could have defeated the Zionist militias, but they didn't because of a prior agreement between the King Hussein and the Zionist authorities to divide up Palestine. Yes. So Jordan took control of the West Bank. The Zionist militias took control of the, um, of the other half. Well, it was more than half, actually. About, um, I think, 65% of historic Palestine was occupied by Zionist militias, even though the partition plan of the United Nations only allocated 35,000, 35 percent, you know, of the Palestine land to be, you know, the state of Israel. Okay, so even though, and then Israel claims that they accepted the partition plan and that, and that the, uh, the Arabs did not, well, which is a big lie, evidently, you know, you can just uh, check the uh, frontier lines. And you can see that Israel did not follow the plan set forth by the United Nations General Assembly. And that, of course, was a resolution of the General Assembly, which Israel claims now is not legitimate when it passes resolutions condemning Israel for its violations of international law. Contradictions upon contradictions. Here, some more Palestinian workers coming home. There's a transport vehicle, likely uh, from Israel, I'm going to go check the license plate to see if it's got an Israel license plate on it. <clears throat> Let's go check. I was right. That's an Israeli license plate. 
that vehicle comes from Israel because it's been transporting Palestinian workers from Israel, 48 Palestine, back to their homes here because they're no, not allowed to sleep in uh, inside 48, not allowed to bring their families inside 48. So uh, they're brought into work as cheap labor and skilled labor. Palestinian workers are excellent workers, all very skilled in all sorts of tra uh, trades, including uh, stone sculpture. Okay, so the Zionist project took off with the remaining refugees who couldn't find any place else to live in the world. Okay. Hi, Laura. Welcome. Now, that was the first wave of settlers that the Zionists took control of, you know, to establish uh, a population that could expand into the territories that were occupied by the uh, Zionist militias. That went beyond, you know, the partition plan uh, frontiers. Okay, the second wave of settlers that were brought into Palestine by the Zionist state were Jewish and Arab, Jewish Arabs from North Africa, uh, from uh, Morocco, from Tunisia, from Libya, from Algeria, from Egypt, and then further in the Orient, from Iraq, and the uh, uh, settlers that came from Morocco came on a willing basis because they thought they would have a, a better life in uh, inside, you know, uh, the state of Israel, uh, to which they were sorely uh, disappointed to because uh, when the uh, Jewish Arab uh, Mizrahim, as they're called, came into Israel, they were given uh, some tents to live in in the desert, basically, in Negev. Now, the, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, immigrants, not refugees, but immigrants, because they were not expelled from the Arab countries. In fact, the Arab countries protected the Jewish people during the um, Second World War, during the Holocaust. In Morocco, the, uh, the King Mohammed V um, uh, assured the protection of the Jewish Moroccans, saying that they belonged to his people and he would not let them, not them, not let them be touched. And they weren't. In Europe, there was another matter because the various uh, European uh, countries uh, had governments that collaborated with the Nazis to one extent or another. If, if, like in France, the Vichy government, you know, um, allowed 40% of the Jewish French population to be taken away and murdered and burned. Now, the second wave of Jewish Arabs who came from the, uh, North Africa, the Mizrahim, came because they uh, thought that they would have a better life uh, in the state of Israel or because they feared for their lives. Why did they fear for their lives? Not because they were being uh, attacked, although there were some riots from time to time, not many. And uh, the fear was instilled in the uh, Jewish Arab population by the activity of the Zionists who came and uh, set off uh, bombs in synagogues as a uh, as an incentive uh, to uh, convince the uh, Jewish Arab population to leave Iraq and Egypt. And in Egypt there was such an attempt made, the Von Affair, in which the, um, uh, the uh, Zionist agents were discovered and stopped from setting off a bomb. In Iraq it was not stopped. And so most of the Jewish Iraqi population left and went to uh, Palestine. Now this population was uh, so numerous that they formed 70% of the Jewish Israeli population in the 50s. Then, that was the second wave of uh, immigrants uh, that the Zionists got control of. And of course, you know, their children were uh, put into an educational system that was uh, uh, just a matter of indoctrination with no uh, Jewish culture taught, just Zionist, you know, history and they became, you know, convinced Zionists. And uh, 
And then the third wave, of course, you know, the, the, the leadership of the Zionist state was all the Ashkenazi European uh, Zionist organizers. And the Mizrahim, who were the vast majority of the population, never got into positions of power. They were only cheap labor again. Now, the third wave of immigration into the Zionist state was uh, from Russia. There, there was a big campaign promoted by the Zionists, but which was legitimate, calling for a Jewish, uh, Jewish rights. Let's advance here, you know, because we're waiting for Gadir to be released from the prison, but they're delaying it. It's getting, uh, there's always problems. So there's about two million uh, Jewish Russians or half Jewish Russians, you know, because there was a lot of assimilation in Russia in which many Jewish people, you know, were married with Christians. Because under the Communist Party rule, the uh, Jewish culture was banned. The synagogues were not allowed to operate, but churches were, you know, the Orthodox, you know, uh, church was allowed, you know, because basically it was a nationalist uh, regime uh, based upon uh, the identity provided by the uh, Orthodox uh, Russian Church. So, the Jewish people, you know, um, were subjected to various waves of anti-Semitism. The first one was uh, in, uh, just after the war when uh, Stalin decided that uh, the Jewish doctors were out to kill him. When in fact they had been probably been keeping him alive in his necropic state, and uh, uh, but uh, you know there was uh, no way to get any you know uh, Jewish civil rights in Russia. The Jewish identity was you know banned you know based upon a 19, 1848 pamphlet written by Marx called On the Jewish Question. A question which doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned. And which uh, formed the basis of the, um, uh, the uh, Communist Party ideology, which uh, decreed that uh, the Jewish people should assimilate and should not exist. This was an um, unhistoric nation, quote-unquote, which uh, had no right to exist, according to uh, communist ideology or Marxist ideology. So, what happens is that the, uh, the Jewish people in Russia, you know, figure, oh, well, this is a, a way to get out, you know, of this dictatorship. And, uh, and also a way to uh, regain their right, proper identity. So they came to uh, Palestine in order to do so. Why to Palestine? I mean, you know, like, why not just leave Russia, you know, if this campaign was uh, having its effect and... Uh, becoming a big embarrassment, you know, for for uh, for the uh, USSR in the world. So why not uh, leave, you know, under such you know, uh, uh, pressure and and uh, find another place to live? Well, they did. Where did they go at first? To Germany. Yes, to Germany until Israel told Germany, cut that out. Don't let any Jewish refugees into Germany. <laughs> so Israel was asking Germany to institute an anti-Jewish uh, immigration policy. So Israel was a source of anti-Semitism. <sighs> so Germany shut the doors to the Russian Jewish uh, immigration and they had nowhere else to go but to Palestine again. So two million uh, Jewish Russians came to Palestine and the percentage of, uh, oh, another Jeep came to uh, Palestine and the uh, uh, percentage uh, of the Jewish Arab population decreased from 70% to 50%, which it is now. Hi. So, But, and uh, then the, uh, the Russian Jewish population prospered to some extent, and they're still using Russian. There's even Russian paper, newspaper there, which circulates for them. 
And uh, that's the way it is. One, two, three waves of immigration that have filled up uh, the occupied territory of Palestine. And the Zionist project continues. Now, we have the settlements. The settlements are expanding. And the money is being poured into the occupation of the West Bank. And it is now proposed that the West Bank uh, settlements in throughout the sector C here, which is about 60% of the West Bank, we're talking about not a portion. When you talk about settlements, you talk about the settlements, together with all of the lands around the settlements, and all of the roads to the settlements, and all of the prospective you know, lands around the settlements as well. All that is uh, proposed for annexation now by Netanyahu in this current election campaign. So how do they expect to fill up these lands? Because, you know, there's only 400,000 settlers and, and there's two and a half million Palestinians. So the idea is to outnumber the Palestinians. So what will they do? The strategy is another wave of immigrants. And how is this fourth wave of immigrants for Zionist settlers to be accomplished? Well, you know, the enticements, you know, to live in a settlement uh, with the... Um, you know, multiple subsidies and uh, free housing, basically, uh, free land with all the services, modern facilities, and even a university at REL, you know. Okay, if that's not enough to attract, you know, uh, Jewish people from elsewhere in the world, what can the Zionists do? Ah, here it is. The basic supporters of the Zionism in the world today are not the Jewish people majority of the Jewish people who live outside of Israel still do not want to go to live in Israel. And the strategy of the Zionists to induce them to come and live in Israel is this. The main body of support for Zionism and the Zionist state is, is what? The Christian supremacist so-called white nationalist movement who love Israel and send money to support the settlements and they want all the Jewish Americans to go and live in the settlements for the sake of re-establishing the ancient kingdom of Israel so that this will bring about the end of days and the coming of you know who Jesus Christ whose real name is Yehoshua ben Yusuf oh check this transport out here I think they're going to make a U-turn. <laughs> yes, here they come. Okay, they're coming down a, uh, a road into the village. Okay, there goes the donkey in the cart. Okay, so how are the designers going to strategize a fourth wave of immigration to fill up the West Bank? And uh, they have their allies going, working for them. Okay, now these allies, you know, love Israel, right? So, but they hate Jewish people. You know, because, you know, they want to make a Christian country, which is what the United States of America is, and they want to keep it for themselves. And just as they took it away from the First Nations, they want to keep it for themselves again by inducing the departure or expulsion of the Jewish Americans, Jewish Canadians and Jewish South Americans to go to, yes, you know it, Palestine. Okay. The plan is, which is already you know, outlined and reported even in the uh, Israeli press, is to have another wave of two million immigrants coming from those countries which are the Christian nation states, which are their allies. So, how would that come about? Well, you know, there's another jeep there. 
the uh, massacre of the uh, synagogue, uh, the Tree of Life synagogue in uh, Pittsburgh, is the beginning of such a campaign. So there's a sort of, you know, a cold civil war happening in the United States in which the Christian supremacists are heavily armed, organized into militias, and are starting to uh, attack the Afro-Americans, the Mexica, uh, uh, people living in the United States, and uh, Jewish Americans as well all under the uh, rubric of the um, President Trump campaign against um, immigrants who are not European Christians. So, that's how the two million Jewish refugees are being planned for by the uh, Zionists, militia, uh, Zionist, you know, uh, state, which expects to be able to induce the immigration of two million more Jewish people into the occupied West Bank here by the force of their anti-Semitic allies who will expel the Jewish people from those countries which they wish to transform into Christian nation-states, pure Christian nation-states, as in, you know, Nazi Germany, which sent a bunch of soldiers out, you know, to occupy all of Europe and anywhere else that they could get to with belt buckles that said Gott mit uns, which means God is with us. More Palestinian workers coming in. This man has a gray beard. He's still working. Yeah, so the radiology is Gott mit uns. And coincidentally, Trump comes from a Jewish American family and is quoted as saying that he's proud of his German blood. Now, you would think that this is a, a statement that is rather sort of, you know, um, as we say in French, uh, um, a statement which is, you know, sort of ridiculous. But consider uh, the fact that, and this is not uh, reported on, in the American population, 25% of the American population are German Americans, who are a majority of the um, North Midwest American states. 26% are Anglo American. 11%, no, 17% are Afro American. And about 15% uh, are uh, uh, Mexica or Spanish speaking Americans. So the uh, 25 and the 26% of uh, Americans who are of European origin are freaking out because they're beginning to be a minority and they want to retain control over the political culture and the political apparatus and state of America and the way to, for them to do so is to stop abortions the way to do so is to stop immigration that does not come from Europe and also to expel those who are already you know, immigrated to the United States. There's 11 million um, uh, undocumented workers in the United States working for cheap wages and keeping the American economy afloat from uh, Central America and South America. Then there's the Jewish Americans who can conveniently be uh, sent away under pressure or fear for their lives to, yes, Palestine. It all fits together. So that would be the fourth wave of immigration that uh, the Zionist strategy is seeking in order to um, maintain uh, control over the entire territory of Palestine and uh, make life so miserable for the Palestinians that there's a new candidate in the Israel election who may be gaining support called Fagel, who is, uh, has a strategy of his own uh, that accompanies all of this, which is to induce the uh, the uh, uh, emigration of the Palestinians by offering them money to leave Palestine. And uh, this is a strategy that uh, has some uh, traction to it, you know, because life is so difficult here for the Palestinians. You know, uh, every family has, uh, has uh, people uh, in it, uh, members of their families. All families have members who have been in prison who 
who are in prison or who have been killed as martyrs, shahid. So, to she seek a, a country that uh, and live in peace, you know, is what many Palestinians want. And if they can get um, paid to go and, and leave, you know, that they would uh, perhaps, you know, take up such an opportunity, except for the fact that uh, the other countries to which they want to emigrate to will not give them a visa. So, the Zionist strategy is sort of in a bind, and uh, we'll see what's going to happen in the election tomorrow. Yes, the Israel election is tomorrow. Now, what's the forecast for the Israel election tomorrow? Well, Netanyahu has proposed the annexation of the settlements and the outposts in the West Bank. Oh yes, by the way, we're still waiting for Gadir to be released from the prison over there. Perhaps they see that there are so many people waiting here for her to be released that they're delaying her release in order to induce people to leave because they don't want this to become too much of a victorious event. It's all psychological warfare. Okay, so we continue to wait. Kadir will come. Now, there's the moon again. It's difficult to get a focus now that there's very little uh, light left in a day. But uh, the election, Israel election now, coming up tomorrow, What's going to happen? Now, the Attorney General of Israel, you know, the chief lawyer of the country, of the state, no, not of the state, of the country, because the judicial apparatus is independent of the state. It's supposed to be a, a checks and balances, you know, provision of liberal democracy in which the judiciary can tell the, the government, you know, to get lost. You know, if the government passes a law which is unconstitutional or undemocratic, you know, the judiciary, like the Supreme Court, can tell them, you know, the law um, is not um, legal anymore and is cancelled. Now, there's one candidate from one of the right-wing uh, parties in coalition with Netanyahu, Ayat Shaked, who put out, you know, a video, publicity for herself, promoting a perfume called fascism. And, uh, it, you know, she's serious. And she is uh, advocating the... Um, um, taking over the Supreme Court so that the appointments to the Supreme Court are made by a governmental committee and not by a commission of, uh, of uh, judges. One thing. Secondly, she wants the uh, Israel Parliament to have the authority, the power to overrule the Supreme Court. So instead of the Supreme Court overruling the Parliament, she wants the Parliament to be able to overrule the Supreme Court. The, which is sort of, you know, like, uh, sort of uh, bizarre, you know, because if the Parliament, Knesset, you know, passes a law which is undemocratic and the Supreme Court says it's undemocratic, then uh, she wants, you know, the uh, Parliament to have a, the power to pass another law saying that they uh, want to pass the law anyway, even though the Supreme Court, you know, has declared it to be undemocratic. To which the Supreme Court could reply, presumably, to say that, no, that law, in addition, is also undemocratic and more so uh, and uh, with the intention to overrule the Supreme Court definitively this would require an essentially a uh, coup d'etat political coup d'etat to destroy you know the uh, the democratic control of the Supreme Court over the Knesset which is rather limited to begin with so that's one of the political parties in tomorrow's uh, lineup Netanyahu himself, on behalf of the Likud party, which is expected to uh, get um, about 26% uh, of the vote. Oh, here's some police. Huh? He doesn't want it? No video? Okay, no video. 
He's ordered me to uh, take the uh, live feed away. Yeah, he sort of began to approach me, so I'm leaving there. I'm going to pull back here. Okay, he's ordering. Uh, he ordered me away, and he was ordering everybody to, with, to withdraw, to pull back. He doesn't want people to be so close to the prison. These are two Ethiopian Jewish soldiers. Now he's uh, insisting, and he's. Uh, but they are withdrawing. They're not using violence. These are Ethiopian prison police who just ordered us back. <sighs> so there, I nearly got arrested again. But uh, the two uh, prison guards are withdrawing now. Here they go, far away. Okay. So that's what it's like here. You know, a population under occupation that uh, is obliged to submit to uh, orders at any time by anybody. Uh, okay. Now, in the Israel election coming up, the story is this. So Netanyahu has uh, proposed the uh, annexation of the settlements and the outposts of the settlements. And uh, supposedly this is to gain more votes. But uh, it may backfire on him because uh, if he pulls votes away from some of the more right-wing parties, they will not be able to get uh, representation in the uh, Knesset parliament uh, because he will not pass the 5% um, vote uh, minimum in order to get uh, seats in the Knesset, which would be an interesting and good phenomenon. But uh, the votes may not uh, necessarily go to uh, his party, the Likud, because he is being accused of corruption, three counts of corruption by the Attorney General. And so this has demoralized his supporters, and they don't want to take make the effort to go out and vote for somebody who's you know like a jerk who's just trying to enrich himself and become a member of the national bourgeoisie by way of a political path now the accusations you know leveled against him of corruption are this at one point in order to get elected in the last election he made a deal with one newspaper publisher to get a more favorable coverage by um, uh, by withdrawing certain privileges for a second competing Israel newspaper uh, that was financed by uh, Adelson, an American uh, billionaire who finances the settlements, who financed this newspaper that was supporting Netanyahu, and yet Netanyahu uh, stopped that newspaper from being, uh, I think it was distributed for free on weekends or on Sabbath or something like that. Anyway, in order for that um, uh, uh, withdrawal of privilege the other uh, paper which is called um, another very old man coming back from work the other newspaper gave uh, Netanyahu more favorable coverage while you know Adelson's newspaper was also giving him favorable coverage so he was getting it you know from both sides except that this became known there was even recording of telephone conversation to that effect and this is considered to be political corruption. Then there's, you know, the um, monetary corruption in which he was, uh, he collected some money uh, kickbacks for giving a contract to uh, some company or other, a military contractor, which bought some submarines, U-boats from Germany. Yes, Germany, which supplied Israel with uh, submarines. To be used as a pa against the Palestinians? No, not against the Palestinians but to function as uh, what the State of Israel has been set up to be, as the guard dog of the Middle East on behalf of the um, 
you know, uh, Western uh, Christian Occidental countries so as to uh, protect access to the Suez Canal, to um, perhaps um, get into the Persian Gulf, to threaten Iran with submarines that may very well have uh, nuclear capable missiles on it. And yes, of course, Israel has nuclear bombs, you know, about 200 or so, supposedly. And so on it goes. And then the third accusation of corruption against Netanyahu was I forget. There's just too much. Okay. Now, the opposition to Netanyahu has been gaining traction. One is this uh, former general who boasts about how many people he killed in Gaza. I think the number is 1,355 or something that he put into a publicity and actually rolled the numbers before everybody to impress everyone. Uh, this general who uh, is, is called by the right wing a... Um, a secret liberal or leftist, uh, Gantz is his name, and he's in uh, formed an alliance with a uh, Lapid, uh, which is a former television uh, personality who formed a centrist party which was calling for secularism, and he wanted to um, force the recruitment of the um, Jewish uh, Orthodox youth into the military. Now the bill to do so was actually the instance which uh, broke up the coalition that uh, Netanyahu had formed previously because the um, Orthodox religious party called Shas of, uh, of Mizrahim, uh, Jewish Arabs, who were supporting the Likud coalition withdrew their support because they couldn't support, you know, this bill which would have recruited their children and their daughters especially, you know, into the military which they could not tolerate. So that's why his coalition fell apart before. Now, if he continues with that policy, then he will not be able to form a new coalition because his support for the Likud has declined. It's expected he will only have 26 seats instead of 30, and that the Gantz Lapid uh, coalition will have 30 or 35 seats. Uh, but they don't have any uh, outstanding partners unless Shas chooses to join in with them. But Lapid, you know, has um, forbidden that because he's, uh, you know, uh, uh, vowed, you know, to oppose the Orthodox and uh, wants to recruit them into the military, which the Orthodox will not agree to. So either Lapid has to give up that provision, which is, you know, his main election plank, basically, what he calls, you know, sharing the burden of military service, because you know, Israelis are finally getting tired of doing military service. So there seems to be a blockage there. And then, you know, Gantz as well, you know, like uh, wouldn't be able to form a, much of a coalition because he opposes forming a coalition with the Palestinian parties, which would be gaining some seats there. So how are they are going to form a majority if they, uh, you know, uh, cannot, you know, form a coalition with either the Shas religious party or the Palestinian political parties? Who knows? Anyway, perhaps they can just function from bill to bill and, you know, lie upon, you know, the majority of votes, you know, on a circumstantial basis. But uh, that's how it lines up to be. Now, the news is we're still waiting for Gadir to be released from the prison. And they seem to be delaying it, you know, because we have so many people here waiting for her. And they seem to be aware of that because they just sent out the two guards there to uh, tell us to get lost. And, of course, you know, on such a mission, they send out, you know, the two Ethiopian Jewish uh, guards to make it look good. Like they're not being racist, that type of, you know, look good. The racism in Israel of Zionism is not the standard racism that you would find in the United States, you know, based upon skin color or, you know, uh, origin. But rather based upon national chauvinism. National chauvinism is, of course, you know, racism, but a different form of racism. And here, the national chauvinism practiced by Zionism claims to be, you know, a national chauvinism based upon, you know, a Jewish nation. However, this is not true. Zionism is an ideology based upon Christian Protestant Restorationist uh, theology and uh, was not an original uh, Jewish proposition. The Jewish people, you know, since the Babylonian uh, exile and the Talmudic uh,
We're looking to see if Gadir is walking out of the prison. There is a woman walking out down the highway there who's petite like Gadir. But uh, doesn't seem to be there, Gadir, no. More Palestinian workers coming back. No, that woman is going away in a car. She's been picked up. It's not Gadir. Okay, so the election tomorrow determines uh, the future uh, of Palestine for the coming period. Now, even though, you know, Netanyahu has uh, made an election promise to uh, annex, you know, the settlements and outposts of Sector C. Hello, Nasser. This is Nasser, another prisoner that I was uh, liberated with. We were in prison together all day, all night. So, this promise, electoral promise of Netanyahu, uh, is not immediately implementable. Even the uh, announced annexation of the Golan Heights was negotiated with the United States and planned for over a two-year period because, you know, these things are against international law and there's many uh, who would oppose. Especially, you know, with the annexation of such a large sector of Palestine, 60% of the West Bank. This would enrage the, the Arab League, who would be obliged to do something. Otherwise, they would suffer the consequences, namely, you know, social revolution in their own countries, which would get rid of those, you know, monarchies who are actually in alliance, you know, with Zionist Israel. So, in order to avoid the destabilization of the entire Middle East, uh, they uh, wouldn't be able to implement such an annexation policy immediately. Everything would depend upon the following year in which the United States of America is holding an election as well. And there Trump is running against and um, trying to get re-elected. Of course, if Trump is re-elected, then they could proceed with the annexation of Sector C of the West Bank here. But if Trump is not elected, and Bernie Sanders is elected the President of the United States of America, then Bernie Sanders has said that he opposes the occupation and this will not go through. And then, uh, you know, the recognition of Palestine will follow through, especially when Jeremy Corbyn is elected Prime Minister of England and on behalf of the Labour Party, and during which he has already promised that the first thing he would do when elected Prime Minister is to recognize the independent state of Palestine. So this whole Zionist trip would begin to be reversed. In fact, it has already begun to be reversed because Israel was forced to retreat from the Sinai Peninsula and the, uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the um, Suez Canal, which it was right up to, in a treaty with Egypt that it was desperate to achieve with Sadat, who was later assassinated. And, uh, for having made such a treaty, but Israel withdrew from the Sinai nonetheless and even removed a couple of settlements that were planted there in the Sinai Desert called the Yarmit, I think it was. The second retreat of the Zionist State of Israel was in Gaza when they had some 500 settlers there and they had to have 5,000 troops planted there in order to protect them. And uh, that became unfeasible and the General Sharon uh, withdrew them in order to consolidate the, uh, the um, security and the power of the Zionist state. Of course, those settlers were merely removed from the Gaza and planted into the West Bank. But uh, nonetheless, Israel was forced to, to withdraw from the Gaza Strip. And since then, they've put it under siege, especially after 2006, when the more radical Hamas party actually won the Palestinian election, which was the first democratic election in the Arab world and which was unrecognized by the rest of the world except for Iran 
and Turkey and a few countries like that okay so that was the second withdrawal of the Zionist state of Israel from territory Gaza and uh, the third withdrawal partial withdrawal minimalist withdrawal was the Oslo agreement in 1993 when Israel actually signed an agreement a peace treaty with the Palestinian uh, PLO Palestine Liberation Organization to form a autonomous government called the Palestinian Authority in uh, the territory here centered in sector A which is basically the cities and of uh, some villages in the villages uh, of Palestine comprising two and a half million Palestinians so the Palestinian Authority was set up and they set up you know like governmental headquarters they had a national police all that sort of apparatus until the second Intifada yeah the reason why the Oslo agreement was signed by Israel is because you know in the first Intifada of 1987 you know, the Palestinians were fighting so fiercely against the um, military occupation that the military was actually suffering and they couldn't sustain such a prolonged internal guerrilla war. So they agreed, the Palestinians, PLO, Arafat, actually Arafat agreed to stop the resistance movement against the military occupation in exchange for the recognition of a partial autonomy in Sector A. With provision for the recognition of the Palestine state over a five-year period of negotiations except that Israel never followed through so the Palestinian Authority remained and so because there was no follow-through there was a second intifada that broke out when the General Sharon was elected Prime Minister of Israel even though he was forbidden to hold higher office after he was considered responsible for personally responsible for the massacre of Sabra Shatila in 19 82 in Lebanon in the Palestinian refugee camp when 3,000 Palestinians were killed by the fascist allies of Israel the Falangists over a three-day period now that was the third withdrawal of Israel from Lebanon when they were first a partial withdrawal up to the Litani River from Beirut after that massacre and then a complete withdrawal from the Tani River to the uh, previous, you know, border with Lebanon. Okay. Then, in uh, 1993, after, yeah, that was in 1985, and then there was the subsequent withdrawal under UN pressure. Then uh, Israel uh, uh, did not withdraw for the Golan Heights, you know, in Syria. That they still occupy, and now they claim this to be annexed. But the Oslo Agreement in 1993 uh, was uh, uh, later uh, smashed by General Sharon when he came in to Nablus and Ramallah and bombed and uh, shelled, you know, with tank shells, you know, the uh, Mukata, the Palestinian political headquarters, and uh, destroyed, you know, pulverized, you know, the, uh, the governmental offices there. That's when Arafat was put under siege until finally he died under mysterious circumstances and probably assassinated by one way or another S -s something to do with you know the water that he was forced to drink probably so so Oslo uh, was smashed but it was reborn and now the Mekatars are rebuilt and now there's a Palestinian Authority which is even going to the International Criminal Court against Israel so Israel retreated and allowed this to happen and they could not reoccupy sector A as General Sharon did in uh, 2001. So what set off the uh, second intifada in 2001 was when General Sharon in a victory sort of you know march of his went into the Alaska Mosque compound plateau there with a thousand soldiers yeah to protect him you know one guy and uh, this was such an outrage you know that the Palestinians revolted you know a military revolt and fought against you know the military occupation which is the right of any you know uh, occupied uh, people to do uh, according to international law so they then retreated finally and the uh, Palestinian Authority was re-established 
and began to acquire certain powers and international stature and international recognition and recognized as the Palestinian state by uh, so many countries uh, throughout the world. So that's where we are at. The Zionist strategy to advance and the Palestinian strategy to counter advance. Now we're still waiting for Gadir to come out of the prison. No word. Yes, I should ask, you know, if the uh, guards had anything to say about the release of Gadir. Did the uh, guards say anything about when Gadir is going to come out? No, they say, they say nothing. They just tell us to go away. Yeah, okay. No news yet for the release of Gadir. Here's this, her husband still waiting for her to return. Okay, resuming the uh, broadcast. I must have touched something. I don't know how long a broadcast, you know, Facebook will take. This is the longest uh, live broadcast I've ever made. I want to be sure that it's going to be saved. So I'm going to save this portion and then I will come back.